right, everybody. Thank you again so much for being here. Really appreciate you. Um, again, to grab your copy of the slides, top right-hand corner, um, that's bit.ly slash high yule maze. Um, one of the reasons why I like this session is because it's so different from the typical like tech conference session. So we're going to talk a little bit less about like check out this product. Um, you know, this is a thing that I do, uh, you know, in my classroom and really talk about one thing. And we're really going to talk about the other side of that. So really that learning first and technology second. Okay. So, um, the idea, yes, we're going to talk about high yield instructional strategies. Yes, we're going to talk about all these factors that are influencing your students in your classrooms, um, things that you haven't even considered yet. Um, but really, we're focusing on those um, instructional strategies that have a lot of bang for your buck um, that you're using with your kids. So um, again, one last time, I know it's on the slides um, forthcoming as well, but uh, that top right hand corner will be the link to get them out for you. All right. So we're going to talk about a few different things. Um, understanding what those high yield instructional strategies are and how you can harness them to transform your classroom. Um, we're all gonna also going to talk a little bit about like educational theory, um, get to uh, some real nerdy stuff in there, which is good. And then um, lastly, uh, mostly talking about how you can remix your lesson. So not asking you to try and create anything from scratch. I know you're all doing wonderful things. How can you use the things that you might see here in this session to enhance the already awesome things that you're doing. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm Matthew Mays. I work at the Stark County Educational Service Center, um, uh, as well as being a, a certified trainer with Google and a million other uh, silly things. But um, a few of these items we're gonna talk about today, um, especially um, IORAD, which uh, hopefully is, is fairly new for some of you, um, but um, being an ambassador with them has been like one of the best things that I've done here in this past year too. So um, I'm excited to, uh, to talk about that too. So for this session, four main areas. Um, the first thing we're gonna talk about is high expectations and why having those for your kids matter. Um, second thing, we're gonna do a deep dive into John Hattie's work. That's the real nerdy section um, where, uh, where we're gonna to get to check out all those visible learning strategies. Um, the third uh, area, we're going to talk about those ed tech things that you can do to bring into your classroom to make those changes. And then lastly, kind of just bring it all together. What does this all mean? Um, how might I be able to use this here for my classroom space? So um, the first thing we're going to talk about um, uh, really dips into the work of Carol Dweck. And um, like I said, those high expectations, believing in yourself as an educator, um, having your students believe in themselves as learners and how that can impact your student achievement. Um, this is one of my favorite uh, infographics of sorts uh, because for people on the outside, they think that teachers just do those three things, right? That in order to be a teacher, you just gotta have your content knowledge, uh, you gotta be able to read and because you're a teacher, you're smart, right? But everybody's sitting in this room and that room there and the room downstairs, we know that it takes all of these things to make that happen, right? You just don't like walk into a classroom because you went to college and to die, you know everything, right? Especially given all of the things that uh, we've learned over the course of the last two years, uh, teachers are now also counselors and therapists and, you know, all of these other things that we were never really told in school. And so um, being able to harness these skills and um, you know, combine them with, yes, obviously you need to know your content and you need to um, you know, be excited about the thing that you're teaching, but being able to combine those will help you to become a more effective teacher and to um, have those uh, high expectations for your kids. So um, like I mentioned before, this really comes down to, um, this section uh, comes down to the work of Carol Dweck um, in that um, you know, there's this growth mindset and there's this fixed mindset. Fixed mindset believes that either you're born with it or you're not. I have what I have, um, you know, that's it. That's what, uh, that's what I have. Whereas a person with growth mindset believes that this intelligence can be developed, that, um, you know, your brain is a muscle. We can do things to enhance your learning. We can learn these new skills, um, you know, if we uh, really focus on trying hard and um, believing that we can do all of these things, that we can pretty much face any challenge. And so, thank you for doing that. And so, um, 
So the idea here is if we can bake that growth mindset into our kids, um, statistically speaking, and we're going to talk about that too, um, we will see this growth um, in our students and um, their performance will uh, be enhanced. So learners with that growth mindset believe that intelligence is not fixed. It's something that I can obviously grow throughout time. Um, it's incrementally built uh, through that effective effort and through that feedback from the person who is running the classroom. That's the teacher, right? Um, and then um, one thing that we know looking at all of this is that um, this intelligence is impacted by all kinds of factors. And that's ideally um, you know, what we're talking about here today. So smart is not something that you are. Smart is something that you get. That's super powerful. You know, if you think about, um, you know, just the, the way that normal schools are structured, student gets a new teacher every single year. The, uh, you know, processes that they had the year previous might be different than how you run your classroom. Um, so kind of helping students to relearn all these things or learn your system, learn your processes um, can be kind of challenging. And so, um, you know, creating an environment where you are being inclusive and creating an environment where like you are excited for your kids to learn is really going to rub off on them. So, um, you know, baking that into your students that like, this is a new year, this is a new opportunity. We are going to get smarter this year, really invigorating for students. So, um, I really like the way that, um, that Carol Dwight baked that down. Um, when it comes to effective effort, it's, um, it really comes down to these six categories. So obviously time, um, our resourcefulness, that's kind of the techie side of me. So, um, you know, this is obviously a tech conference. We are all technology professionals, but it's really fun to sit in these and go, oh, I didn't know that thing existed. I didn't know that thing existed, right? And we're pulling all these resources in. Um, so that's super fun. Um, focus, we have our feedback. Um, you know, these persistent strategies. So our ability to help kids to say like, well, you know, this isn't necessarily correct, but I'd really like for you to try again. And I'd like for you to try this when you do it again. Um, one of the things that um, yeah, I was guilty of it as a kid, I was a Nintendo kid, right? Um, I tried to make Mario go uh, through every level as fast as he can. I would time myself when something would go wrong, I hit the reset button and, you know, I try it again and I try something different. I adapt. One of the things that we have to fight uh, in our classrooms is kids just flat out picking up and saying, can't do this. Never going to be able to do this. I'm out. Right. Um, it's a really difficult conversation for kids, especially when that kind of a mindset may have been instilled in them either from home or from previous teachers. So being able to um, help them to stay committed to um, help them to remain determined uh, is definitely uh, something that we're shooting for. We have these life liberating beliefs. I included um, an extra little GIF on number three. So as a Google uh, certified trainer, this to me kind of spoke out, right? So um, good students work together uh, with others. They ask for help. They use their feedback to get smarter. That's basically what Google for Education is, right? So. Um, are we going to talk about things that are in the Google bubble today? Absolutely. But one of the things um, that I tried to put into this presentation as best I could is playing outside of that playground. So um, by no means am I like a shill for Google. Um, yes, there are really wonderful uh, resources, and tools, but there are also tons of things outside of that bubble. So don't be afraid, even though you may be a, a Google district. Um, there are a lot of really wonderful things elsewhere too. So some of the resources that I'm going to show you um, are things that I've created or, or things that are derived in Google, but know that um, I'm down for anything. So don't think that I'm up here, uh, you know, trying to, to push all those things off. So why do we start here? Why did I want to start with this um, kind of as the lead off to all of these other things? Um, that's because that mindset matters. So as we talk about uh, these visible learning effect sizes and whatnot uh, here throughout the rest of the presentation, know that student self-efficacy in our example, that's you, and collective teacher efficacy, um, that's me in this situation. If I believe that I can have an impact on you and you believe that you can get smarter, research says that that is really, really good for our classroom. We'll talk about what those numbers mean um, here in just a moment. But that's really, really good stuff. So if you can instill that um, in your teaching team, if you can instill this in your students, 
you have already gone well out out of your way to um, you know give your students the best opportunity to learn and to grow smarter. Um, if you're looking for something extra, and I'm going to jump out here for just a second to kind of hit on this growth mindset mentality, check out this mindset kit. So if you select here, um, there are all kinds of resources, tools um, that go along with Carol Dweck's work, as well as all kinds of other uh, really fun things. If you look up across the top, it says for teachers. Um, there are um, a bunch of already made resources for you that kind of help you get the ball rolling here as you're uh, starting that conversation with your kids. Okay, so with all of that in mind, let's get to the meat of our, uh, our presentation. So um, visible learning research done by John Hattie, um, global research uh, has gone into this and um, all of these things are done to help you enhance your teaching. So um, through his visible uh, learning kind of academy, like his research institute, they've identified more than 320 factors that influence student achievement. These things are wild. We're going to go and um, dig into these here in just a moment, but they range from things that are happening in your classroom, like right now, while you aren't there, um, to things that happened literally before they were born, right? Um, and it's really interesting to see how all of these kind of things, um, you know, play into your students. So what John Hattie did was he broke it down into all of these various sections. So um, you know, factors that are like student-based, that are home-based, school-based. You can see like the curriculum that is chosen uh, for your school, um, the technology that is available to your kids while they're in school, the technology that they have while they're at home. All of these things matter um, as we are considering our students. What they found was that um, through their research studies, through all of their data, that 0.4 was kind of what they call the hinge point. So um, the numbers that are above 0.4 are seen as highly effective. So if you think back to our example previously, um, when we were looking here, 0.65, obviously above 0.4, right? And then 1.36 is what, three times uh, almost, uh, even more than that. So um, there, are, um, there are varying degrees of these effect sizes, including some that are like really negative. Um, and so the idea here is uh, if you look at uh, the numbers here, like 0.15 to 0.4, those are things that like your average teacher just kind of doing their thing, not really doing anything outside of the box. That's pretty much just what your average teacher is going to give you. Um, if you look at above that point, so 0.4 to, um, you know, in, in our example here, like that 1.2, that blue area, that's a sweet spot. Those are the things that we're going to be talking about um, through the rest of our, uh, our time here together. So um, as you're looking through these numbers, make sure that you're, you know, you have that 0.4 kind of in the back of your mind that anything that's above 0.4, those are the things I really want to uh, be looking at, be considering for uh, my classroom. And the things that are under that, and you're going to hear some trendy things, you're going to see some things that I'm sure uh, in your districts uh, they may be doing, but uh, research has, has proven uh, them to have varying degrees of success. So um, what I'd really like for you to do is to make your way to this slide if you have not already. Um, this is um, slide 19. I'm going to do uh, like a cardinal sin of presenting. I'm going to stop talking for four minutes. During that four minute window, it's going to be really quiet and your lunch is going to set in and you're going to want to take a nap. Please don't. I'd really like for you to click on this link here. So that's the visible learning meta X. And when you do, you are going to be taken to um, this kind of home base for all of John Hattie's work. All I want you to do is to explore. So if you wanted to, you could jump here where it says view all influences. And this is going to give you the mega list of all of those like 320 plus strategies that we talked about. If you wanted to, you could just keep scrolling all the way down. Um, you're going to see, uh, you know, all of these different things. Um, if you look over here on the far left, it tells you the influence. So almost think of those as kind of um, like your main idea, right? Like, what are we talking about? Um, you'll see the domain. That's that category that we mentioned a couple minutes ago. Um, 
you'll also see like the impact on student achievement. That's that number. That's that effect size. Basically, all they've done is kind of cut to the chase for you and said like, yep, this is a thing that's likely to have an impact on your students or no, this is not a, um, you know, a strategy that you would want. Like this one here even has likely to have a negative impact. So it will tell you that. As you scroll over on the side, you can see that number, the effect size. You'll also see a confidence level. That confidence level is derived from the number of studies where this influence has been researched. So in this example up top, ability grouping for students or for gifted students has an overall confidence of three, that's out of five. Um, and it's based on 137 <coughs> different studies. So if you wanted to, you could click on that influence and it takes you to the page that is completely like specific to just that influence. And then as you scroll down, it shows you all of the research studies that were done to basically give us that 0.4, or I'm sorry, to give us that effect size. And remember, 0.4 is our hinge point in that, um, that instance, okay? So I'd really like for you to tinker around on here. Feel free to use all of your filters over here on the far left. So if you, um, you wanted to look at only like 0.4 and above, you could do that. Um, if you wanna do number of studies, you could totally do that. You have all of these different check boxes to help you as well. However, I am going to stop talking. And so for four minutes, I'd like for you to just consider what you see look for outliers, look for things that you, um, you know, may be uh, happening in your school or things that you know that you've tried in the past or like really shocking, um, you know, either good or bad things. Four minutes. I'll see you then. All right. Tell me some things that you saw. Good, bad. Music has a music playing in the background has a point one effect size and I think people tend to generalize, you know, oh, I'm gonna let my kids listen to music with their AirPods and they work better, you know, and it's not, it's not that. You have just described my wife. Um, you saw her on the slide there at the beginning. Uh, we were literally talking about this at dinner last night. She said, I always hated when teachers played music because I would sit there like this just so that I could try and focus, right? So just because we may, uh, learn better that way doesn't mean that all kids learn better that way or just because we like to have sound going doesn't mean that they're all that way i really appreciate you sharing what else? I, I filtered with a wide lens because i'm looking at it um, at a district level and so i was looking <laughs> at district school and out of school and looking at what the highest negative impacts are mm -hmm. and those would be screen time availability mobile devices mm -hmm. so, so yep it really kind of makes you question balancing one one programs and, and ubiquitous access to technology with, with potential negatives. Absolutely. Um, so we have to ask more questions about how that's adding to instruction. Absolutely. So again, I'm going to go back to my family, which you saw in the first one. Um, don't let my daughter watch TV. She's four. Um, she doesn't get on computers. She doesn't do any of that. And it's for that exact reason. So people again assume that because I am a you know technology integration uh, you know leader that uh, like, oh, she must be a wish. She must do all this. Like, uh -uh. like, what do you mean? Said, like, oh, I don't want her to be that way. <laughs> like, if if when she becomes an adult, if that's a thing that she's interested in, sure. But I know she's going to get it all over the place, right? It just it it's so baked in, um, you know, to everything that uh, that our kids are doing. So yeah. Striking that balance is super important. I really appreciate you sharing. Oops, I'm sorry, one more time. So, um, you know, just a few other things that I pulled out. Um, again, think about that point four. We're going to have that um, kind of in the back of our brain for the rest of our presentation here. Um, just some interesting things that I saw, just some buzzy things, um, you know, things that have a really big uh you know, effect size, we're going to cover of different ways that you can do that um, within your classrooms, within your building. Um, some of the things I know we hit on, um, you know, screen time, um, ability grouping, television viewing at home, um, even like really wild things. Like I said, um, if you are searching through there, um, you know, the way that the child was fed, you know, like out of the womb, like that matters. They studied that, how they did that. I have no idea, but that's a thing that, you know, has an effect size on here. So um, definitely make sure that, uh, that you're keeping all those things in mind. 
Again, four minutes does not do that justice. We could spend years talking about all the data um, that was included in there. Uh, the next part of our presentation here is kind of like a highway. I'm gonna keep chugging down the road and we're gonna talk about all kinds of different factors, but I also know that uh, there's the ADD part of my brain that if I see something cool, I'm like, ooh, cool. And I'm gonna take that detour, right? That's my offering. If that's you and you wanna investigate some of the things that we're about to talk about further, please take the off ramp. You're not gonna hurt my feelings. Um, if you see something cool and you want to take more time uh, doing those things, please do that, all right? Um, we are gonna talk about just a few um, things that I think you could bring into your classroom uh, to hit some of these influence factors. Um, before we uh, really dig into the numbers and get into that, I wanted to throw a shout out here to K20 Learn. It's one of my favorite websites that not very many people know. Um, basically, it's like educational trading cards. So um, when you go there, there are all kinds of instructional strategies that are waiting for you. And you can filter it up here at the top with all kinds of things like time um, you know, in your lesson, like placement in your lesson, like number of students that you have. And um, it's going to return all kinds of strategies. So as an example here, I'll click on three, two, one, just real quick. And it shows you that trading card, like they're literal, like digital trading cards. So it tells you what the strategy is. When you click it, it flips it over to the back where it gives you a summary and then an exact play by play of how to execute that thing in your classroom. Um, for many of them, there are also videos included that will walk you through exactly how to do, um, you know, that. Uh, specific strategy, which is really, really cool. So um, before we really dig into the numbers, I wanted to include that in. All right, first stop, um, we are going to talk about three different ones, um, or three different influence factors. So RTI, deliberate practice, mastery learning. The remainder of the slides are all set up this way. So you're going to see that um, influence effect size over here on the far left. You're going to see that line, like, you know, does this have potential to accelerate, you know, considerable potential, those kinds of things. Here's a little bit of a discussion about that if you're unfamiliar with it. And then um, in the bottom there, I'm gonna include some different resources for you. So to hit at RTI, Deliberate Practice and Mastery Learning, I created this spreadsheet. Um, essentially what this is, um, and feel free to make your copies, do whatever you need to um, of this. But essentially what this is, is a way to follow along with your students throughout any lesson. So this is just an example of, um, of one that I created here. So let's say we were math teachers, right? Um, the concept or the skill that I'm talking about is three digit addition with regrouping. Here are all of my students that are part of this class. And as I'm working with my students that may be like small group, that may be uh, you know, whole class kind of type deal, but I am able to then place and move and assess my students on an ongoing basis so that as I'm having um, you know, conversations either with my kids, with their parents, with administrators, and they say, well, you know, um, Sally is struggling with, um, in this case, um, you know, three-digit addition with regrouping, I can say, you know what, you're right. I noticed that, and we'll just we'll jump to we'll jump names, we'll say Harry, uh, you know, he is struggling with that. He's struggling specifically with like that regrouping. What I did was we used manipulatives in this small group and I was able to help him understand that concept. I really think that next week when we go on to, you know, this other area that he's gonna show that growth and, you know, we'll be able to push him into that next section. So at a very quick glance, I get to see where all of my kids are, you know, within that unit, within that lesson. Um, I also have a really good idea, a really good gauge for, um, you know, where I am at as a teacher, right? If I am correctly, uh, you know, identifying where these students may be. So this isn't something that um, is meant to be punitive in any way. This is just a way for you to kind of get a good scattershot, you know, picture of where all of your kids are at one moment. So um, the middle tab here, the one that I sent you to has all the instructions, basically what all of these different categories mean. You have your example on the far left, and then there's a blank copy for yourself here um, as the first one too. So um, if that was an area that you were trying to hit, then um, I think that's a, a cool resource that you could bring in. Another thing that we know um, is really powerful for kids is self-reporting of grades. So that has a 1.33 effect size. And this is different than what you're thinking. So it's not just got an A, 10 out of 10. I'm done. I'm really smart. Moving on to the next one. 
the power here in self-reporting of grades is uh, like all of the extra stuff that goes along with that. So what did I do to get that grade? You know, what steps were, um, you know, a part of that process? So I spelled it out as like achievement is much more than just a letter. And so using this spreadsheet, you can ask kids to basically keep track of their own work. Um, teachers can preload this. So um, basically, I keep jumping in and out here. Let me move this slightly. Um, so the idea here is a teacher could choose to preload this. Um, you could do it by nine weeks. You could do it by semesters. You could do it by however you want. Um, the teacher can name all of those assignments over here in their first column and then make that copy out for kids. So go into classroom and make a copy for each student. Ta-da, they all have this green tracker that they can use. Again, this stuff is fine, right? I got, you know, 10 out of 10. I got three out of 10, whatever. This over here, that personal reflection, that's really where we want to spend our time. That's really where we want our students to focus. So yes, you got five out of 10, but tell me why you got five out of 10. Think about all of the steps along the way that went into that. Did you not understand that concept? Um, you know, for some students, like, did you try really hard, um, you know, at studying or practicing these things? Did that matter in you achieving the score? Maybe it was a really rough week at home. Think about all of those things. These all matter um, for our students. So again, please feel free to make your copies, do whatever you need to do. I loaded it up with uh, four different nine weeks, as well as that instruction summary there in the beginning for you too. Um, as we're continuing to think about that um, self-reporting of grades, if you're interested in rubrics, I do another presentation and I just included that on there for you as well. So again, that's a whole other thing that we're not going to take time on. But if you wanted to um, you know, see some tools that could help you with the um, with your reporting of grades, then um, you know, please check that out. I'm going to skip jigsaw method um, just because I think it um, is kind of self-explanatory, um, but using Google Slides, I think, can definitely help you to achieve that in um, a very easy way with your kids. So um, definitely check that one out. Um, as we're thinking about prior ability and achievement, um, you know, it's very easy to pop out those questions in classroom, just pop them out in the discussion um, area. Um, you know, think about that question, ask them really quickly, to die, it returns it back to me. Um, the ability to use forms, um, you know, quickly and efficiently there in classroom, I think definitely helps too. And then I want to kind of build that bridge over to enhancing prior knowledge. Um, one of the links that I included here for you is the learn area of Google Arts and Culture. So this is one of my favorite places on the internet. Essentially, again, I'm not a show for Google. I'm just saying it outright. Google's trying to document literally everything. So all of mankind, they want to know about it. Um, that's essentially the genesis of arts and culture. So, um, you know, you can virtually travel uh, the world through, you know, 360 images. You can look at paintings that are in museums that are never, ever going to leave these museums um, in like VR experiences, right? I can walk around all these different things. I can hold these things. I can investigate and manipulate them. Um, as you look down below and why I sent you to this learn area is they have fully downloadable lesson plans. Um, so these are, uh, you know, various grade levels. So don't think of this as something that, you know, only your upper grades can do. Um, this is, you know, open and available to everybody. You can take your virtual field trips as a part of this too. Um, as well as like all kinds of other games and whatnot. They have a really fun like phone app that's available for Apple and Android, where you can do things like the art filter, where it makes you look like these famous paintings from, um, you know, from uh, your history. Um, you can do your art selfies. You can like take a picture of your face and it shows you, uh, you know, historical uh, pictures of things that look like you. So all these really fun ways. I know in the previous session, they were talking about Steam, right? This is definitely a really fun and engaging way to bring that art piece into um, any lesson that you may uh, be having. The other area that I want to highlight that is so underutilized, but is um, another one of my like favorite places to be on the internet um, is the Hidden Worlds. So this is a pocket of the arts and culture website. And basically what they've done, this guy has the greatest job in the world. Um, he uh, goes to uh, these places throughout the world. He has a backpack on with like a big stick camera and he just walks around. And as he walks around, he pushes this little button and it captures this area 
Um, and that's essentially how they do like Google Earth and whatnot too, like your street views, except it's up on a car. Um, this guy like goes into the Carlsbad Caverns and is actually walking through. Um, the fun part about this is that they've partnered with um, different park rangers in these areas as well. And so um, the park rangers are telling the story. So um, to visit the island of Hawaii is to take a trip back in time when the map of the world was still bubbling beneath the surface of the ocean. Explore the land shaped by- All right, so I'm gonna skip ahead real quick. And I now have this, you know, 360 view. My park ranger is talking to me. You can see her up in the top corner and I get to choose. So now like I can actually walk through the caverns and see all these things. Um, for our kids, as we're trying to consider, you know, enhancing this prior knowledge or, or, you know, giving our kids these experiences, like, I mean, we are in Raised Family, Ohio, right? The likelihood that some of our kids are going to get to go to a whole, a Hawaii by the time they come to us, it's very small. Um, but with something like this, we are allowing them to step outside of the classroom, outside of Ohio, um, and to see these incredible places throughout the world. Yes, it's not exactly the same as being there, but pretty darn close. And with all our VR headsets and everything that, um, that are available, um, it's only getting better and better. So um, definitely make sure that you uh, are checking that out. Again, another session that I have is all about that arts and culture space. There's a link to that at the very bottom. Um, if you'd like to check it out, it goes very, very deep into the arts and culture. Do they add, does he add more to that page that right now there's Than the five? Yeah. So I've only ever seen those five. Okay. Um, I think they um, kind of went in a different direction with that idea. Um, and so there's not the devoted like national parks space. They don't have those interviews with um, the park rangers outside of those five. Um, but you can find them on arts and culture, basically like when they got rid of expeditions, they basically nested it into arts and culture. So you'll be able to see a lot of those things in there too. So slightly different than um, what you may have seen in expeditions, um, slightly different than what I just showed you, but um, still awesome and, and worth, worth your time. Okay, great question. I'd love to be that person though, right? Like, hey, I'm in this national park, come interview me, let's make this thing up, right? That'd be super fun. So um, when I retire in 50 years, I'll be the backpack guy. You'll see me walking around there. Um, all right, so a couple other things here uh, before our time uh, wraps up. As we're thinking about micro teaching and video review of lessons, this is you, the teacher, doing these things. So, um, you know, how can you structure uh, what it is that you have to teach? And how can you structure, like, your own viewing of your teaching? Like, what are you learning from your own teaching? Um, I know we've talked a lot about, like, Screencastify um, here in the pandemic um, or during the pandemic. We have a lot of uh, those tools. I really like Loom. Um, if you have not used it before, it's just like all the other ones, uh, except it puts out really crisp video. Um, but for the most part, it's an extension that lives up here in the top. You can record your thing, really nice video editing on the back end of that too. Um, you can also record for longer than what you would in a Screencastify as well too. So um, definitely make sure that you check that out. Uh, I said it at the beginning, my favorite new product of the year is IORAD. Uh, essentially, the way that IORAD works is you click the extension, it starts it up, um, you just do your thing. So um, for an example, I'm going to hop in here to my drive and we'll start up an IORAD. I'm going to capture a new one, we'll start. It gives me the countdown, three, two, one. And now it's basically watching all of what I'm doing, right? So like my camera is not on, it's not activated. But I'm just going to click on things. So we'll open this up. And when I get here, hopefully it'll load. Come on, page. We'll go back. We'll try a different one that doesn't have so much stuff. So I'll click here. I'll click here. And since that's um, taken a little bit to load, I'm going to come back up here. You'll notice that my IORAD extension is blinking. That's basically telling me it's recording. And as I click it again, I get the ability to stop it. So when I come onto this screen, it shows me all of those steps. So you'll notice um, it tracked eight different things that I did. So I'm gonna send this away, that way you can see. 
it tracked eight different things that I did there in that motion. Obviously I had to go a different route there. So that's why you see some of those. Um, but in each of these steps, it's highlighting the thing that I did. So it'll say like, scroll your screen, click on these words, do this thing. I didn't type anything, right? Just that AI knew what I was doing and it's starting to populate some of those words. Um, you can do all kinds of things uh, as in uh, like masking your content. So if this is sensitive information, it could be like student names, student numbers. I can blur that out so that nobody can see those things. Um, I can add audio to these. Um, I could do all kinds of different things. And it is awesome, uh, especially for uh, people who are in uh, a role similar to mine, or if you're showing people uh, things frequently, um, or if you want to you know, show processes for how your district does things, especially I'm thinking like new students, I'm thinking, um, you know, new teachers, these are, you know, how you fill out your forms. This is where you do, uh, you know, attendance. This is how you do all these things. I have an awesome tool for that. So um, as you're thinking about your own teaching, as you're thinking about the tasks that you have, um, possibly consider uh, giving IORAD a shot. Um, just a couple other quick things here too. Um, you know, if your students are having those discussions, if they're, um, you know, considering like help seeking, um, there are all kinds of things that you could do. Uh, plus commenting uh, is just wonderful. So anytime you have it over in the side, you hit that comment up in the top corner. If you start your comment, or you don't have to start it, um, you can say whatever you want. And then when you're ready, you can hit the um, at symbol, start typing out a name, and it will instantly tag that person. That person's going to get an email that says, Matthew Mays has just tagged you in this, um, you know, in this discussion. And here's what he said. And if you click it, you're going to go right there. So um, definitely make sure that uh, you're considering that as well. Um, for feedback, this is super important. Our kids want to know uh, what you have to say or, or, or want to know how you are viewing their learning, the things that they can do to get better. So um, try out some of the things that I have down there at the bottom. Again, Loom, super easy to use. Screencastify, super easy to use. Moat is also a really wonderful like audio capturing tool to help you execute that as well. Um, Canva has been talked about in two of the three sessions that I've been to today. It's excellent. There's reason for that. It's so much fun. Um, so definitely make sure that you're uh, considering Canva as you're thinking about concept mapping. I also shared with you uh, just, I just call it like my mega cache of uh, Google drawing templates. So um, basically all I did was I, you know, as I'm casually traveling the interwebs, uh, if I came across a template for uh, something in Google Drawing, I just captured it and put it into this slide here. So you'll see all kinds of things, um, you know, from a bunch of different people, but these are all open and available for you to make your copy and to uh, use with your students. So here's a really good three circle Venn diagram that you can use ready to go for you in Google Drawing. All right, so definitely check that out. I think there's like close to 100 different things in there. Um, for all kinds of purposes, for all kinds of uh, different grade levels too. All right, I can see that we're almost done. So I'm gonna wrap up with these last few. Um, there are a lot of really fun Chrome experiments. They have folded these in with that arts and culture website too. So there's some great places um, that you can go um, that will allow your kids to experience some of these creativity programs um, that have that 0.58 effect size. So uh, definitely make sure that you're checking those out and um, we'll end here on goal commitment. So um, similar to the, um, the one resource that I shared with you at the beginning, um, this is a, a great place that you can go to help your students consider what it's like to actually set real goals, right? To have your teacher teams come together to set those uh, goals that are actually like attainable, but still far enough out there that you, know, you get to chase. So this is the rework. Um, it's another Google um, product or another Google space where there are all kinds of tools in here uh, ready to help you and your students um, in your schools, uh, if that was a thing that you uh, were interested in, to kind of harness the power of goal setting and um, to make that impactful for, uh, for your building, okay? Um, so as we're you know, wrapping things up, we're bringing it all together. Um, you know, Hattie talks about all kinds of things, um, but consider you know, the things that your successful teachers are doing. That's not a mistake. They're successful for a reason. 
So, um, you know, they have clear learning intentions. They let the kids know those. The kids can recite them back. Um, you know, they have challenging criteria. There's this range of learning strategies. So it's not just, you know, the same, you know, you're not just playing the hits over and over. You're, uh, you know, teaching in a very diverse way. Um, you're providing them timely and specific feedback to students that they need. And then you are visibly learning yourself. That's why you're here today. That's awesome. Uh, let your students know that you were here, that you're improving, you know, you're teaching, that you're finding all these new things for them because that's the example that they need, right? Learning never stops, right? Smart is something that you get. We're not all there yet. Um, you know, we are continuing to grow our brains uh, even uh, at, uh, at our level. So um, all of that is going to have an impact on your students. So um, big, big takeaways there are three. Um, the hits are the best practice. So definitely make sure that you find what works for you or areas that you want to investigate. Um, your mindset matters. That's why we started with that. Hopefully, uh, you know, in your classrooms, you're having those conversations with kids, um, not just at the beginning of the year, but throughout the year, string those all through and know that there is support online for just about everything you want. Um, so definitely make sure that you're finding those. And I threw in a, a Dumbledore quote because I'm a Harry Potter nerd too. So shout out Dumbledore. Um, but um, if you have any questions about uh, anything that we talked about here, I would love to uh, have those conversations with you. If there's something that you saw and it hits you, you know, three weeks from now and you have a question, please shout out um, to me. You can find my contact information here as well. Um, lastly, you could have chosen any room to walk into. Um, there are unbelievable presenters throughout this whole conference. This is one of my favorites throughout the whole year. So um, you could have chosen any of those rooms and you chose this one. And I really, really appreciate you for doing that. So. Thank you so much. If you have questions, please feel free um, to uh, come up and, and we can chat. Otherwise, really appreciate you being here. Thank you.